Start the bidding on this one at $100,000 now. $2,600,000 for Stefan. $1,500,000. Sold for $49 million. It's a world-class museum, art gallery, and jewelry store all rolled into one, where you can spend millions on an original Van Gogh or make millions selling a 37-carat diamond ring. Join me as we go behind closed doors of Sotheby's Auction House. Just about everyone has heard of Sotheby's, but few know exactly how they collect and sell their precious goods. We obtained exclusive access to see how they cater to some of the world's most discerning collectors. It's not like you're selling food, clothing, and shelter. You're selling more than that. You're selling lifestyle. You're selling glamour. You're selling power. Power. You're selling something that people imagine themselves to be. Sotheby's is basically an elite middleman. They find people with rare and expensive collections or items they need to sell, then auction them off to the highest bidder. They make their money on commission, charging both the buyer and the seller. $15 million. The oldest and most famous auction house in the world, Sotheby's began in London in 1744 with a book auction. Now, this publicly traded company is represented in 46 countries spanning five continents. Last year, their sales reached $1.6 billion. Heading it all is Sotheby's chairman, Bill Ruprecht. I met with him a few hours before one of many auctions they hold here in New York each week. Tonight, you're going to have a lot of people sitting there who will spend millions without even thinking, like my, we might buy a pack of gum. Well, I think they'll be thinking. I, I, there is nothing to focus your mind like millions of dollars being associated with a wink or a nod. Uh, don't don't uh, misthink what it means to spend a couple of million dollars in a couple of seconds. It's a powerful thing that really does get your heart moving. Over the years, Sotheby's has auctioned some of the world's most famous and expensive collections, including the estate of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, personal items from Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, and even the bones of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. They've made an art of auctioning art. They shattered records with Van Gogh's irises and a Renoir that sold for $78 million. But what happens on the auction floor is only a small part of Sotheby's operation. Their Manhattan offices encompass 10 stories, occupying 400,000 square feet. They have 43 different departments, specializing in everything from art to antiquities, manuscripts to memorabilia. Their inventory is a revolving door. Last year, they sold more than 110,000 items. They continually search the world for new pieces to acquire. We pretty much operate on what we call the three Ds, basically death, debt, and divorce. It, I have to say, we get a lot of phone calls from people because they're simply in dire straits and they need money. Acquiring the rights to sell a private collection or a multi-million dollar estate is a competitive business. To maintain their edge, Sotheby's employs a team of specialists to evaluate, authenticate, and appraise anything. Tucked away in an apartment on Manhattan's Upper East Side is a treasure trove of antiques. Designer John Christensen is moving and wants to sell his extensive collection of furnishings. So Sotheby's has dispatched Muffy Cunningham and Peter Hathaway, two of its furniture experts, to take a look. What we're going to have to do, I'm afraid, is make your life hell for a few days. They go from one end of the apartment to the other, evaluating everything. It, I would estimate it about seven to nine or eight to twelve thousand at auction. The estimate should be really aggressive. It's a very rare form. It can get messy. To get to the bottom of this 18th century chair, the recently added black webbing has to go. Sorry to make such a mess. Why are you cleaning, buddy? Marble. It's okay. But the process doesn't end there. Behind closed doors back at Sotheby's, any item that's acquired is re-examined by more specialists. Whether it's a piece of furniture or a painting, everything gets appraised and authenticated. We do the research from the beginning. When a picture comes in here, 
whether it's by Miro or Monet or anybody, we begin from scratch. We make no assumptions. Anyone can contact Sotheby's, but not every item is worthy of their auction block. It may be priceless to you, but NSV to them. NSV means no sale value, and we have become quite articulate over the years about the different ways you can say, no, sorry, it's just not, you know, it's not doesn't have any value. But the news isn't always bad. One lucky person found a rare first printing of the Declaration of Independence hidden in the back of a picture frame. It was purchased at a flea market for $4. It sold for more than $8 million. The stakes are high and the competition is fierce. The auction world was shocked when Sotheby's and its biggest rival Christie's were accused by the Justice Department of price fixing by conspiring to charge sellers inflated commissions. Sotheby's former chairman A. Alfred Taubman and former CEO Diana Brooks were both found guilty. For many of the staff and, and many of our clients, as there was really a breach of trust, there's no question it was a really disturbing and difficult time for everybody associated with the business, and we're really glad it's largely behind us. Despite the scandal, bad publicity, and millions of dollars in fines, Sotheby's is still able to land some of the biggest and best collections. When a multi-million dollar jewelry collection from the estate of a New York socialite came up for sale, Sotheby's had to prove they could outmarket the other auction houses. I can't tell you how many sleepless nights of staying up and worrying and thinking, how are we going to outsmart them? How are we going to provide a proposal and a marketing plan that's going to outdo our competitors? The winning strategy? showcase the collection with a 16-city world tour. Wow. Look at that. Culminating with a black tie reception in New York City. It's absolutely exquisite, and I would wear it. When we come back, millions of dollars in diamonds, rubies, and emeralds go on the block. 10,000. And I find out what it takes to sell, sell, sell. I say it's sold. <laughs> Behind closed doors will continue in a moment here on A&E. Behind closed doors with Joan London continues here on A&E. This jewelry is worth millions of dollars, and the collection has been shown around the world. There's so much attention to detail. Prospective buyers have had a chance to see it, touch it, and try it on. Tonight, they'll have a chance to buy it at an exclusive Sotheby's auction in New York City. Case 10. Here you go, fellas. The Janice Levin collection is 154 pieces of jewelry that belong to one woman. And you'll find that there are pieces of every color, every shape, many designers. Janice Levin was a wealthy New Yorker and a connoisseur of fine jewelry. Lisa Hubbard traveled with the collection and gave me a personal preview. The shapes are all different. It was hard not to be dazzled by this extraordinary jewelry. May I? Yes, you may. I started to take let me, let me, No, no, let me help you. This platinum and diamond necklace designed by Harry Winston took my breath away. So that no matter how you turn, it it's glitters sparkle. and it's... Oh, oh my God. Sparkle plenty. Sparkles so much. And it is. It's over 150 carats of diamonds. It's just amazing. And how many carats is this thing? 37.25. Wow. The ring was estimated to go for between one and one and a half million dollars. But for me, the most impressive item was this emerald and diamond necklace. The 12 emeralds were from the collection of the Maharaja of Indore. Pre-sale estimate, more than a million dollars. Yes, this is a piece that could start driving something up because somebody wants the most special piece of a collection even, right? That's exactly right. Lisa knows all about the prices. She'll be the auctioneer for the Levin collection. Whether it's jewelry or art, much of the success of an auction rests on the auctioneer's ability to sell. $12,500,000. Now, what makes a good auctioneer? The ability to kind of establish instant rapport. You have to be outgoing. You have to inspire confidence. You have to set the pace. You have to keep them happy. You know, it's, it's a performance. 
three million dollars, three million two, two, three million four. For the auctioneers, it's a bit of a juggling act. They have to keep an eye on a room full of bidders, know the items and their starting prices, and keep the bids straight. It's high speed and high pressure. Before auctioneers face a real audience, they train for six months with mock auctions. Well, Joan, I gather you're ready to take your first lesson in auction. I got a rare opportunity to find out just how tough it is. Hugh Hildesley, a trainer and expert auctioneer, was my coach. You are in complete control of the room. You create the enthusiasm. You drive them along. It's a position of ultimate power. Oh, you like your That's job. That's the theory, anyhow. Okay. That's the theory. I'd be selling three items, starting with an antique clock. Ladies and gentlemen, we're starting with lot three, which is an 18th century clock. If you'll take a look at it, it's wonderfully whimsical, decorative. And our bidding today starts at $50,000. Do I see $50,000? 50. ,000? 50 on the phones, we have $50,000. It really didn't seem that difficult at first. Do I hear 130? 130? Then I'll go with $120,000. You own lot number three. The next round promised to be more challenging. I was sure Hugh had something planned. I just didn't know what it would be. Do I hear an opening bid of $12,000? That is the assessed value. It could be worth much, much more. No matter what I said, no one would raise a paddle. We're just testing you. We were hanging okay. you out to dry <laughs> to see how you do. What do you do when you're out there if nobody puts... You go on to the pass? next lot, you pass. Oh, go. OK. The most difficult thing was keeping track of the price increments as the bids increased. 9000 Will you go 9500 back there in the back row? We've well, got plenty okay. up front as well. OK, 10000 here in the front row. 1500 2000 2500 Where am I going? Oh, wait a second. <laughs> I'm sorry. From you 10. just got a great deal. <laughs> I just went from 45000 You went from 10000 okay, to 25000 Okay, I'm sorry. 10000 I meant 12000 not 2000 <laughs> Hugh assured me that with enough practice, you find a rhythm and it all becomes second nature. All right. I say it's sold. <laughs> <laughs> but tonight's auction is no game. The stakes are high and millions of dollars hang in the balance. Behind closed doors, a fortune in jewelry waits to be sold. The collection is estimated to be worth between six and nine million dollars. So everyone's every move is carefully watched. Closed circuit cameras are everywhere. They're monitored around the clock from this control room. Backstage, there is a nervous energy as months of preparation come down to this moment. Out front, the house is packed with bidders waiting for their chance to spend millions. While hundreds of guests register and pick up their paddles, behind the scenes, the jewelry models make last-minute adjustments. To protect the integrity of the auction and the privacy of Sotheby's elite clientele, we agreed not to show their faces. Not all of the bidders will be on the auction floor. Three phone banks allow clients to call in and place bids from anywhere in the world. Good luck, partner. Thank you. Auctioneer Lisa Hubbard takes her place center stage. At 7 p.m. sharp, the auction begins. Let's start with lot number one. Magnificent jewels of Janice Levin. And we'll start the bidding on this one at three thousand dollars now. Three thousand now. Four thousand five. Six seven thousand dollars now. Eight thousand dollars now. Gentlemen's bid at eight. Eighty five hundred. Nine thousand and ninety. Ninety five hundred. Ten thousand five now. Gentlemen's bid. Eleven thousand now. Eleven thousand. Twelve thousand. Fourteen thousand now. Fifteen thousand is bid. At fifteen thousand dollars now. And down it goes for fifteen thousand. Fair warning. These private skyboxes are reserved for Sotheby's high rollers who get a bird's eye view of the action. The first thing that hits you is the amount of money being bid and how quickly it all happens. Same bar, 7,500, paddle one, two, eight, eight. Most items are sold in 40 to 60 seconds. Down it goes, 29,000. Some bidders are looking for a bargain. Others are intent on winning at any cost. For them, the game plan is simple. Stick your hand up in the air and keep it there. $6,000, 6500 gentlemen. Tell you, it puts a lot of people off. $20,000. Yeah. 
21, 22,000, 23,000 in bids, 24, 25, 25,000. Congratulations. One by one, the items sell and the prices soar. Fair warning for $175,000. 175, Carolyn. Then I move ringside next to the phone bidders. With a little help from Seth Bright of Sotheby's, I'll be bidding for a client in Hong Kong. It's my chance to get into the game, but with someone else's money. I can't tell you who my client is, but he's in the market for this Van Cleef and Arpels necklace. Oh, I'm also on a budget. The client has set a top bid of $15,000. Can I say nine? Say 8,500. Bidding 8,500? 11. 11? 11. 12. Say 13. 13,000. 14,000. Say 15. 15,000. 16. 17,000. Perfect. 16. 17,000. That's perfect. I guess we shouldn't call him in the morning and tell him he didn't get it. <laughs> That's too bad. For me, it was over in just 14 seconds. The necklace ended up selling for $22,000. 185 now on my right. $300,000. $500,000 now. $800,000 By the end of the evening, the prices have skyrocketed and the audience has dwindled. Now, only the serious shoppers are left. At $850,000, now the bid is $850,000. $850 now. That diamond and emerald necklace I tried on sells for just under one million dollars. For 975. Fair warning. But that isn't the most costly item in the collection. There's still a simple little pair of 22 carat diamond earrings. We all done? Fair warning. One million five. To the order. One million five hundred thousand. Thank you all. Come back. Come back all. In all, the Levin estate sold for more than $9.2 million, comfortably hitting the high end of the pre-sale estimates. That's one more successful auction to their credit. But the staff here must continue to search the world for rare and valuable items to collect and sell behind closed doors at Sotheby's Auction House. I'd like to extend my personal thanks to all those who helped us gain unprecedented access to make this show possible. Please join us next time, and once again, we go behind closed doors. For a &E, I'm Joan London.